Yeah. All right. Well, hello, everybody. We're here again. This is, I think, the fourth installment of the Denver Health Workers United Teach Yourself. Uh, today is super duper exciting. We have uh, Lisa here from the Harm Reduction Action Center. She's going to teach us everything we want to know about people who inject drugs. It's going to be super exciting, super informative, and I can't wait to get started. So, Lisa, here you are. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, if you could manage the chat, um, please feel free to ask questions along the way. This is how we all learn. If you've heard me present before, I do. it's going to be a little different today, so I thought you'd appreciate that. Um, the Harm Reduction Action Center is Colorado's largest public health agency that works specifically with people who inject drugs. In a magical world, there'd be no drugs, but we live here and there's one safe thing that folks can do today. So I'm gonna talk about syringe access. I'm gonna talk about the seven pieces of statewide legislation we've passed in the last 10 years. I've got data for the data nerds. We're gonna talk about overdose prevention. And then I'm really gonna highlight a healthcare provider survey that recently was completed by folks in the inpatient and ED of Denver Health and inpatient and ED of University Hospital. So we can talk about the challenges and opportunities of working with people who inject, because as you know, there's quite a few. Um, harm reduction reduces the harms associated with X. Today we're talking in relation to drug use. This is just the best breakdown I've ever seen. Abstinence is a friend of harm reduction. It's just simply not a requirement. We believe if people want to live a life of recovery, they shouldn't have to live with preventable diseases such as HIV and hepatitis C. We believe if people don't want to live a life of recovery, they shouldn't have to live with preventable diseases such as HIV and hepatitis C. And we do know that relapse is a part of recovery for so many folks in our community. So we want to recognize that it happens on a continuum. I'll, also, I will not talk about addiction today. What I talk about is chaotic drug use and non-chaotic, problematic and non-problematic. Harm reduction is no place for ego. It's a place to forget what you think you know and set aside your opinion so that when you meet people where they're at, you can take the time to ask them where they want to go. If stigma, shame, and incarceration worked with drug use, we'd have wrapped this puppy up years ago. All that's done is drive use underground where people have gotten preventable chronic diseases such as HIV, hepatitis C, and died of overdose. So we're doing something different. Um, know the racist drug history, it's very abridged. We could do a whole uh, hour long presentation about this, but we wanna talk about obviously prohibition and then uh, the, the war on drug users has been incredibly racist and classist for, since forever, but definitely over 40 years. The war on drug users was declared in the 1970s at the same time the DEA was established. We know that crack was first introduced in the early 80s. Um, we also know that Reagan signed the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986, making those mandatory minimum penalties for drug offenses. Then 1995 came in with the crime bill continuing to uh, contribute to mass incarceration. Uh, President Bush then really militarized the domestic drug law enforcement. Opioid prescription sales quadrupled between 1999 and 2010. While Obama did support changes to reducing the crack powder uh, sentencing disparity, we still have a federal ban on syringe exchange funding. Uh, so that means I can't get any money from the feds, <laughs> but they want you to keep those rates low. Um, and we know that the states did start having uh, medical marijuana laws and then marijuana reform across the country. And then the opioid epidemic was declared a national emergency just a couple years ago. That's the very abridged version. There's a common misconception that people who inject don't care about their health, they actually do. I go out and I do this present presentation a lot, especially with healthcare providers. We have black tar heroin in Colorado, which is difficult to smart, snort and expensive to smoke. So you almost have to exclusively inject it. So when we talk about heroin in Colorado, we're specifically talking about people who inject heroin. The average heroin injector injects three to five times a day, the average meth injector once or twice a day, and the average cocaine injector 12 to 15 times a day. I wanna make sure they use new sterile equipment every single time to prevent and eliminate the transmission of HIV and hepatitis C. We also know that anytime you break your skin, you're at risk of infection. One swipe of an alcohol pad will keep folks out of the emergency department for costly skin tissue infections. Colorado Hospital Association says the hospitals pay out about $6,000 a day on IV antibiotics with an average stay of five days for a soft skin tissue infection that could be completely prevented with an alcohol pad that costs less than a penny. So there are a lot of barriers for uh, healthcare treatment for people who inject drugs. There's a deeply entrenched street rumor in Denver um, among the emergency departments, but Denver Health in particular, that folks are gonna be warrant checked in the emergency department. That's false, that's a HIPAA violation, but that doesn't speak to their relationship with law enforcement, that speaks to their relationship with healthcare providers, that instead of healthcare providers, they think are you know 
you know, trying to check them in, they really weren't checking them. So a lot of times folks won't go to the emergency department. It's not uncommon for clinicians to assume that people don't care about their health, right? Um, so a lot of people will end up doing things on their own, such as especially lancing abscesses. Oftentimes, in the next one you can see, oftentimes when folks have abscesses, oftentimes they're lanced without much anesthesia because if it hurts enough, you'll stop doing drugs. But really all that does is the next time they have an abscess, they're trying to lance it in my bathroom. And if I don't have that, if I don't allow that, they're going to try to do it underneath a bridge. We also know that healthcare providers can oftentimes bring in other people to gawk at patients without their permission. Vague or unrealistic aftercare plans. Most of the time when folks are on an observation of an overdose, right, so it happened in the field, they go to the emergency department, they're discharged and the discharge papers say stop using drugs, please. Okay, but that's a little tricky, especially since inpatient's virtually a story of hope at this point. Um, and we know that they're gonna use probably after an overdose, unless they're able to start on something, Suboxone or Methadone, but even with Methadone, you still have to use for quite a few days because you start at 30 milligrams and it's not enough to keep you well. Long speeches and shaming life lectures, and patients often overhear healthcare providers talking negatively about them out behind the curtain. <laughs> we can hear you behind the curtain. So Dr. Mackenzie Garcia, who's a resident at Denver Health, um, did a 2020 healthcare provider survey that just recently came out um, with those uh, Denver Health and university folks uh, participating. So we were really excited to see about the challenges and opportunities and how we can push forward. So this is really one of the first times that we're actually talking about this. So um, Jacob and I thought you would enjoy this. Um, so the internal medicine staff generally had more positive attitudes towards people who inject than the emergency department staff. Physicians and social workers generally have more positive attitudes than nurses and technicians. And advanced practice providers, attitudes generally fall in between these two groups. A majority of the clinicians do not think that harm reduction practices lead to increased substance use. Awesome. Less than 5% of clinicians at Denver Health and University are not interested in implementing harm reduction with patients. 65% of ED staff members and 75% of internal staff believe they could develop a substance use disorder under different circumstances. And the common barriers that clinicians identify to implementing harm reduction include lack of knowledge about harm reduction, they don't know where to send people for harm reduction resources, they don't have time to discuss harm reduction, and they need to prioritize connecting patients to treatment, which I can imagine is very frustrating. Uh, many clinicians would be interested in support from the Harm Reduction Action Center through tours and trainings, which we thought, great. So I want everybody today, if you have somebody that actively injects drugs, please refer them to me, I want them. And when, when's the last time anybody's ever said that to you? Uh, we are now located at 8th and Lincoln, so we're not too far away from Denver Health at all. We are now located in the old La Centrale uh, restaurant. We've been an agency for 18 years. We've only had the ability to exchange syringes for the last eight and a half. So clinicians identified several barriers to implementing harm reduction, not knowing to send, feeling they had to prioritize connecting patients to treatment. And 50% of our folks are stimulant users upon intake. And by stimulant, I'm actually talking 50% are meth users upon intake. There's virtually nothing for uh, treatment for meth users. And so I know that that can be very frustrating for everybody involved in the hospital, healthcare providers, and people who inject when it seems that they have to prioritize treatment when we want them prioritizing harm reduction. Uh, they defer the conversations to social workers, so I want everybody that comes in contact with somebody who injects to refer to us, and then obviously not having that time. 34 clinicians agreed that people should be put in jail or prison if they were caught with illicit drugs, and 33 clinicians were unsure whether people should be in jail or prison if they are caught with illicit drugs. We, we already tried that, right? Stigma, shame, and incarceration, and we know we can't arrest our way out of chaotic drug use, or would have already done so before. Um, so actually, currently I get more referrals to my program from the Denver Police Department than I do from Denver Health. That's weird, <laughs> right? I really need healthcare providers referring to us. Um, some key barriers that they identified, perception that patients who inject drugs can be adversarial, and we know that they can be fussy. We totally get that, right? But we wanna talk about those challenges and opportunities. They desire to prioritize treatment, feelings of helplessness among clinicians because of their inability to make a real difference for people who inject, especially when folks are unhoused. I think it's a very tall order and tall ask to ask unhoused folks to be sober in our community with all the crisis management that happens on the streets. 
So for a lot of my folks, especially meth users, um, housing is substance use treatment because a lot of times, especially in Denver, folks will inject meth in the winter uh, who don't wanna go into the shelters so they can walk around the city and not lay down and freeze to death. So for some folks in our community, using meth is a survival method. Um, and so oftentimes when they have that housing, they don't need to use meth and um, oftentimes flourish and live a life for recovery. Um, and then there's the lack of institutionalized processes to provide people who inject drugs, including syringes at the hospital. Um, hospitals can give out syringes. We passed legislation last year that emergency departments can give out um, syringes. Because uh, we know, especially in those rural areas, that it can be re very frustrating that somebody comes in with an abscess that could be completely prevented with a sterile syringe and an alcohol pad, but yet they have to be discharged without access to any of that, knowing that they're going to land back in there again. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, six people are not interested in implementing harm reduction with their patients, and 16 are not sure whether they are interested in implementing harm reduction with their patients. So we want to change that. Okay, so we talked to our participants. What would you like to tell doctors or even healthcare providers about people who inject? There are people who want and do quit drugs. It's a different world. Listen to us about the best veins to hit. <laughs> we talked to folks. No one's more intimately involved with their veins than people who inject drugs. And actually, there's no bigger health nerds in the world than people who inject drugs and healthcare providers. You, they, everybody thirsts for this factual health information. And so a lot of times people really want to talk about endocarditis, necrotizing fasciitis, osteomyelitis. And we talk about that a lot in the syringe access program too, because it's very difficult to protect yourself if you don't know how to acquire some of these. Uh, give more trainings, uh, use programs, refer to us. Um, and then uh, hospital human resources to support healthcare workers. We're people too, we aren't bad or immoral. I didn't intend to become a person who uses drugs. We deserve care and compassion. We need mental health care. So um, not everybody that uses has, has mental health issues, but we do know that there's a lot of self-medication that happens, especially for our schizophrenics. So we asked our folks, what does great or excellent care look like versus fair or poor, right? Gentle asking questions, advice on hep C management, didn't seem judgmental versus lectured on life choices, went from congenial to harsh, refused to believe me, ignored me, and discharged without help, right? So we wanna talk about that and push forward. There's more than 11 million people who inject drugs in the United States. Obviously, that's an undercount. Uh, stigma and shame have been very clear not to tell anybody unless you're at a syringe access program. 1.4 million are living with HIV, 5.6 million are living with hep C, and 1.2 million are living with both HIV and hepatitis C, which both could be completely prevented by access to sterile equipment and sterile syringes. So why does somebody inject, right? No one just wakes up and says, today is the day I'm gonna start injecting, that's gonna be magical, right? Jacob and I are hanging out, sharing a bag of cocaine. He snorts his half up. I only need a little bit to inject with. He's gonna look at me and he's gonna say that looks like a bigger, better high, more economical and to show him how. So we talk about not modeling in front of non-injectors so you don't even get asked, right? Seeing someone inject takes the fear out of it. Um, hearing people talk about the rush and other benefits, bigger, better, high. We know that oxys are sometimes running about 50 cents a milligram on the streets of Denver. 180 milligram pills, $40. $40 will keep you well and heroin a lot longer than that. So while that's a national shift, that is sometimes what we see locally. Feeling like the odd one out, I know all about that. I recently got onto Facebook. And then, like I said, learning that initially it is more economical to inject versus snorting or smoking. Fun facts about syringe access programs. There's about 14 of us in the state. We're currently happening in 35 states and 60 countries. It reduces injection-related diseases such as HIV and hepatitis C, and the risk for injection-related bacterial infections. We talk about, like I said, endocarditis, necrotizing fasciitis, osteomyelitis, hep B, hep C, HIV. It improves public safety. The state health department tells people to put used syringes in a coffee can, wrap them in duct tape, and put them in the dumpster. Nobody feels good about that, right? Mine are incinerated. Does not increase crime in the neighborhoods in which they are located. Actually, our folks are, close the door. Um, our folks are very motivated to invest in the health and safety of the community in which we serve because we're the one safe space in the entire world they can talk realistically about their drug use, right? So we wanna make sure that we protect the area and our folks do a really good job. Protection of law enforcement. We know that one third of law enforcement officers nationally will be pricked by a syringe at some point in their career. Two thirds of that one third will be pricked multiple times. We've passed two pieces of statewide legislation to promote proper syringe disposal so folks can come across town with used syringes 
and to reduce needle stick injuries with law enforcement. So before law enforcement pats me down and asks if I have anything sharp, and they always do, and I say yes, and they don't get pricked, I don't get charged. So we've essentially decriminalized the syringe by having that communication. Now, we, we know with some work with law enforcement that oftentimes they don't know about the law. And as you can imagine, most law enforcement doesn't wanna hear about law changes from people who use drugs. <laughs> so it's really important that we try to get out there and talk about the implementation and how it protects um, the entire community. Taxpayer money savings. The average person is living 25 plus years with HIV, which is great. It's now a managed chronic disease. But let's talk about prevention. My needles cost a dime. And evidence-based, there's not many more rigorously tested best practices to treat chaotic and non-chaotic drug use as a health issue and not a moral or criminal issue. Data nerds, this one's for you. So like I said, we've been an agency for 18 years. We've only had the ability to exchange syringes for the last eight and a half. We've had 10,441 folks sign up with us as of June 30th. I see about 120 to 150 people per morning being proactive about their health. Thankfully, no one's mandated to be there. That's more parole and probation's job, right? So our folks are being proactive about their health and coming in. We've done 158,135 syringe access episodes. That's every single time we're engaging with folks, creating a relationship where they can dispose properly of used syringes, get access to sterile syringes to prevent and eliminate the transmission of HIV and hepatitis C, and offered resources, referrals. Do you wanna to talk to staff today about Medicaid enrollment, mental health, substance use treatment, naloxone, testing, PrEP, fentanyl testing strips, health education classes, vein care? 75,960 times they said yes, right? We wanna connect them right away. What are my trickiest referrals? Substance use treatment and mental health support. So we try to be as one-stop shop as possible. We have somebody from MHCD, Mental Health Center of Denver, that's in our agency twice a week doing intakes for folks. Uh, we have substance use navigators in there three mornings a week. We have somebody from Medicaid that helps sign folks up on Friday uh, mornings. And then we also have somebody from St. Francis Center that comes in to help with transitional housing, but also getting your ID. If you've never had a Colorado ID, now we need to get your birth certificate and your social security card sent to our place because they can get mail there. Then I can get them on the ID run. Now we have to make appointments with the DMV. Then we can get their ID. Then they can push forward, right? So it's kind of the queen of baby steps. And at this point, we've trained almost 4,000 people who use drugs to recognize and respond to an overdose. And we're actually just over 2,000 lives saved to date. We know this because they come back to us, they tell us about it, we fill out a form and we high five them. Drugs injected most in the past 30 days before coming to us. Like I said, we're about 50-50 at heroin and meth. We've got 16% are goofballs, which is heroin and meth together. 28% of our folks surveyed had smoked crack in the past year. 79% of participants surveyed had smoked meth in the past year. So we now also give out pipes. So crack pipe stems and uh, meth bubbles we're giving out to folks um, for a few reasons. Smoking is risk reduction over injecting, right? Not many people in town work with people who smoke crack. So it's really important that we're engaging with them um, and you know, resources and referrals and creating that relationship. And then also it's a time of COVID. We know people are smoking. We wanna make sure that they have their own equipment and they're not sharing it. 72% of our folks identify as male. That's also kind of a national trend that we see. 30% uh, of our folks are housed upon intake, meaning their name is on the lease or mortgage. 31% are unstably housed, and then 49% are homeless. That's primarily street homeless. You can't use in the shelters. They have the doors off the men's bathroom. Um, and a lot of times, especially if you use heroin, you wake up in withdrawal. So most of my folks end up being outside. 90% of folks have never been to a syringe access program before. 74% heard about us from a friend. It's hard to walk into a party by yourself. Imagine walking into the exchange. A lot of people think we're the cops or the cops are sitting out front and profiling because why would we be nice to them and lure them in, right? Thankfully, the cops do not sit out front and profile in Denver. They do do that in other states though, which is incredibly problematic for uh, those programs. 34% of folks had no health insurance at time of intake. 2% of folks have VA insurance or are part of the VA. We are currently, what, 18 years into the current war. We've had quite a few folks um, come back that tried uh, heroin in Afghanistan. 24% of our folks are hep C positive upon intake, 3% are HIV positive. For the folks that don't know their status, do they want to test with us today? 
After reviewing all the research to date, the senior scientists, the Department of Health and Human Services and I have unanimously agreed that there's conclusive scientific evidence that syringe exchange programs as part of a comprehensive HIV prevention strategy uh, reduces the transmission of HIV and does not encourage the use of illegal drugs. That's Dr. David Satcher. Um, if we were all together in a room, I would ask you to shout out what year you think Satcher said that. And he would say, April 1998. Welcome to the late 90s. We are not being revolutionary. This is the magnification of a needle before use, after one use, and after six uses. It starts to curve and shred. Um, when you don't have access to sterile syringes in your community, it doesn't mean that folks aren't injecting, right? It means they're using the ones over on the right. So we want to make sure, and we see that oftentimes with folks where they will use like a matchbook or things like that to try to sharpen it, which we know get to, con that continues to be dull, and then people end up, um, you know, messing up their veins uh, because we don't want them injecting with a dull needle. The question of enabling, let's just talk about it. I got into harm reduction to protect people to, in their communities from HIV, hepatitis C, and overdose, to feel like they have someone to talk to, someone who cares, someone who respects them and their humanity, to ask for help and to help others in turn, to find drug treatment and healthcare, to reconnect with their families, to rebuild their lives, and to take personal responsibility for their health and their futures. If that makes me an enabler, I'm proud to claim that term. That was Daniel Raymond out of the Harm Reduction Coalition. We just went a long time not doing anything, right? We're enabling folks for a healthier and safer them today. There is something positive that folks can do today. Even if I can get them into treatment tomorrow, if then that's what they want, we still know that they're gonna use today, three to five times a day, once or twice, or 12 to 15 times, right? There's something positive that folks can do today. And we want, we're creating that relationship so when they wanna do something different, we're the first folks they come to. Okay, we're transitioning to overdose. We are in the midst of an overdose crisis. It's primarily a fentanyl crisis, but we are seeing um, stimulant overdoses are up, not only in Colorado, but in the United States. I know this is what this one's a little tough to see, but I, I don't like it when uh, overdose graphs go just from the 2000s. We've lost a lot of good people for a lot of, long time. So this is from 1980 to 2016. In 2019, we lost 71,999 folks to drug overdose deaths in the United States. Of that almost 72,000, we lost 1,062 in the state of Colorado. Of that 1,062 in the state, we lost 225 to drug-related deaths in the city and county of Denver. In two, 2020, we just hit 225 drug-related deaths last week in Denver. So 2020 is going to be our highest um, uh, our highest uh, or deadliest year yet. Unfortunately, we were seeing even in the first portion of 2020, Colorado was number four in most drug overdose deaths already over 2019. So it's probably going to be Colorado's deadliest year yet as well. So as you can see, especially over the years, heroin, cocaine, crack, and meth overdoses have gone up. This is in, from the Colorado Health Institute in um, 2015, 2016. And so these are 18 of my participants that died of very public overdose deaths in the last four years. A lot of times when we talk about data, it's like this number, that number. Um, all these folks died uh, outside in alleys, in parks, or in business bathrooms. Um, and oftentimes it used to just be cops coming up on people overdosing and everybody is fine with that. Now it's 17 year old baristas who are being re-triggered every day because they don't wanna clean the bathroom before they go home because they're afraid of coming up on somebody overdosing. And pre-pandemic, it was basically uh, business bathrooms and then hospital campus bathrooms that were the only unlocked bathrooms in town, um, which is why some people may think that they're seeing more public injecting now. Most of it is that it would have been happening at the Denver Public Library or Starbucks, um, which is closed down uh, bathrooms and um, hospital campuses. So there's four main reasons why people overdose. The first is the change in the quality of the drug, especially the opioid. Fentanyl is here. We were never too cute to think that fentanyl wouldn't be here. Um, so we always talk to folks about, you know, asking others who've purchased from the seller uh, and doing tester shots before they use. The second main reason is any change in tolerance, any period of abstinence, coming out of jail, prison, treatment, living a life of recovery, puts folks at higher risk of overdosing. 
Folks coming out of incarceration are 129 times more likely to overdose post-incarceration in those first two weeks than the general population. The third main reason is mixing, especially for opioids. If you use opioids for any period of time, you're no longer getting high. You're going from minus physical withdrawal pain, the flu times a thousand to normal or well. So you might put a benzo on board, right? Or alcohol, which we know those drugs are synergistic. And then the fourth main reason is simply using alone by the very fact that no one's there to witness, recognize, or respond. We have the antidote, it's called naloxone or Narcan. It's safe and highly effective. Paramedics and emergency departments have been using it for over 40 years, which is really great if people call 911 or it happens around paramedics or emergency departments. But it's difficult for a lot of people to wanna to call 911 because oftentimes law enforcement will come and using drugs is, is criminalized and all the things. So we wanna have naloxone in the hands of people who use drugs first and foremost so that they can be those first responders. And then we have legislation that anybody in the state of Colorado can carry it. As all of you know, it's an opioid antagonist. You can't get high from it. The only thing it can do is knock the opioid off the receptor and hold for 30 to 90 minutes while you rescue breathe for someone and call 911. There's no side effects except the precipitation of withdrawal and it's administered intramuscular or intranasal. There's four main types that people can have out in the community. This is the Narcan that goes up one nostril and sprays. The top one is the intranasal. The bottom is injectable. And then the F0 auto injectors on the left. It's actually very expensive, but it's the wave of the future because it talks you through how to recognize and respond to an overdose. This is our overdose memorial wall. When folks didn't have access to naloxone, it doesn't mean they didn't try. There's a lot of street myths. I mean, how many times have you, you know, seen in a movie that they throw somebody in the shower who's overdosing? Um, this is our why, right? Dead drug users do not have the opportunity for recovery. And when people are alive, there's hope. So like I said, we passed Senate Bill 14 in 2013. This limits civil and criminal liability. Um, it's not often a doc can prescribe something to you that you will use on somebody else. Um, but this has been really great to have it in the hands of not only people who use drugs, but also those around them. Law enforcement, mothers, homeless service providers, me. Denver Health and Hospital does something very innovative that anybody in an observation of an overdose is discharged with naloxone or asked if they wanna take naloxone with them, which is really great. We understand that we're pretty sure that University Hospital is doing that as well. There's over 470 pharmacies today in the state of Colorado. You can walk into and get access to naloxone virtually over the counter. It's still a prescription drug, but they are using a standing order so you don't have to go to a physician. There's 202 law enforcement departments in the state carrying Narcan. Denver Police Department was first. Colorado Springs PD was second. And there's six county jails that train heroin users in jail how to recognize and respond to an overdose and put that naloxone in their property for upon release because they know about that 129 times more likely to overdose post-incarceration. It's Arapaho, Boulder, Denver, Douglas, Jefferson, and Larimer County jails. So the seven pieces of statewide legislation we've passed in the last 11 years, syringe exchange in 2010, we have two 911 Good Samaritan laws. Jacob and I are hanging out doing drugs. He overdoses and in good faith, I call 911 and stay with him. We don't get new drug charges. He goes to the hospital, I go on my merry way incentivize. Well, cause what happened is over the years is people ran because they were afraid to call 911. Uh, we have the participant exemption to end the needle prevention so folks can carry sterile and used syringes in the state of Colorado not loaded um, as long as they disclose to law enforcement before they're pat down or their vehicle searched we have that third party naloxone so anybody in the state can carry it and actually all 50 states have passed naloxone uh, access for third parties to anywhere in the United States and then the standing orders with access to naloxone that you can get it at a harm reduction organization or in a pharmacy it is to be noted that in 2015, all 100 state legislators voted in support of it and they never agree on anything. But they were like, basically like, if you wanna have access to naloxone, you can have access to naloxone. And House Bill 1065 has passed. Uh, that was earlier in 2020. Um, they're encouraging pharmacists to prescribe to who are prescribing a, an opioid to notify the individual that they have about the ability, uh, the availability of naloxone. 
uh, a pharmacist or pharmacy tech can sell syringes to people in the state of Colorado. That was always kind of allowable, but the, the law was nebulous. Um, and then a nonprofit organization can operate a syringe exchange program without local board of health approval. Um, we, they had 10 years to be able to do that. And so there's a couple of counties that are really struggling. And then uh, civil and criminal immunity for a person who administers expired naloxone to someone who they believe is overdosing because we know that uh, expired naloxone is just fine. Safer syringe disposal initiative. These are about four feet high. These are all over uh, New York City. If you've ever been there, you bumped into them. We have a few of them in Denver. Um, this allows 24 seven syringe disposal. The first one we put in was in October, 2015 at Colfax and Spear when that used to be the largest drug dealing trafficking corner in the city, as you may remember. Um, 1,500 syringes were appropriately disposed in that first year, which is really great. Um, we just got numbers back that, um, that the, in the last year, they've had quite a few, um, I think it's like 10,000 or 20,000, just in the last uh, year of the other disposals that are around the city. Um, pharmacies can sell syringes but don't allow disposal. Hours of operation for syringe access programs are limited. The fear of ticketing or additional days incarcerated. Uh, difficulty disposing, public at disposal can be rare outside of Denver especially, and an issue for unhoused diabetics. People living in chaotic drug use tend to be more successful at making positive changes in their lives. If they first have their most, most basic needs met like food and shelter, access to healthcare, meaningful connection and being treated with dignity, regardless of whether or not they continue to use drugs and not contingent on if the difficult circumstances in their lives have changed. That's Chris out of the Southwest Recovery Alliance in Arizona. Okay, so we're gonna transition. I only have a few more slides and then we can take more questions. Um, so we're pushing forward with overdose prevention sites or supervised use sites, safe consumption spaces, taking drug use out of the public sphere and putting it into a controlled environment. Right now I can give folks everything they need to prevent and eliminate the transmission of HIV and hepatitis C, resources, referrals, and naloxone, but it's not legal for them to inject on my property. Use and, uh, use and possession on the property can get the property seized. So they go a few blocks away to an alley or a business bathroom and they inject there often alone. Not only are they injecting there, they're overdosing there, and not only are they overdosing there, they're dying of overdoses in these public places, as you know. The drugs are pre-obtained, meaning they're not bought or sold on site and people inject themselves. It would simply be a program arm of an already flourishing syringe access program. It reduces injection-related diseases such as HIV and hepatitis C because all the equipment is sterile. It reduces skin tissue infections. If I'm in an alley behind a dumpster, I may not take that time to use that alcohol pad. And we talked about anytime you break your skin, you're at risk of infection. It promotes proper disposal. It happens right there. And it's currently happening in 11 countries and over 150 sites. And in over 20 years, no one's ever died of an overdose at one of these places because there's a trained professional there to recognize and respond. And the same cannot be said for Starbucks or libraries or RTD transit stations. There's been 13 uh, overdose deaths in a Denver RTD transit station in the last two and a half years. Obviously, it's been peer reviewed, scientifically studied. <laughs> um, all the major players are up there, right? Increased to access to drug treatment. The number one substance use treatment admission requirement in Denver, Colorado, and the United States is that people have to be alive, right? Dead drug users do not have the opportunity for recovery. When people are alive, there's hope. But I wanna talk about the bottom three. It does not increase, increase community drug use. It does not increase initiation into injection drug use, and it does not increase drug-related crime, right? Folks are invested in the health and safety of the community in which we serve, and they protect us because if we get kicked out for neighbor drama, we'll have nowhere to go. And we have use sites all over town. I just want them supervised and sterile. And we know public restrooms have become ground zero. Uh, we know that baristas are currently our uh, supervisors and in injection sites. Um, and overdoses in public bathrooms are turning baristas and other service workers into first responders. And this is a physician in uh, New York City. We need to play that game where we require politicians to finish every sentence denouncing supervised injection facilities with the phrase. And that is why I think injecting alone in a McDonald's bathroom is better. <laughs> All right, questions, issues, concerns. So right now in the chat, there's a question about how the program was funded. Yes, uh, so we're a hodgepodge. I run about an $850,000 organizational budget. Um, 
We don't get any money from the feds. There are, I do get money from two national foundations. Um, there's about six national foundations that fund syringe access programs. Um, I get some money from the state health department, especially from the tobacco tax. I get some money from the city of Denver. And then I have about 6,000 uh, individual donors. And then we do, in the non-COVID world, we do two fundraisers a year. So I'm kind of a hodgepodge. And there was a question earlier on, and it kind of ties in, I think, to one of the slides at the beginning. Uh, you mentioned that uh, replacing lectures and uh, just moralistic denunciations uh, with informative information about risk reduction uh, is a, a helpful transition. Uh, one of our participants uh, wanted to know if there was going to be like kind of a show notes that could go out with all of these awesome statistics and quotes that you have so we could begin, uh, I don't know, giving these people this information and being so charismatic about it. <laughs> uh, yes, well, you know, I, hate to, I would hate to just read off of slides. Um, I, can, I can send some further information out, absolutely. <laughs> you got to give them a little zhuzh and pep. Exactly. Also, uh, what are your hours of operation so we can start referring people to your, uh, your facility more effectively? Awesome. I appreciate that. So we're on the southeast corner of 8th and Lincoln. And for syringe access, we're Monday through Friday, 9 to noon. Uh, we know that's not the greatest time that's ever lived. I'm in good neighbor agreement. So those are the only time that I can do the syringe access piece. Um, so people do not need an ID. They know who they are. There is a one-time HIPAA confidential intake that takes about 10 minutes. They'll leave there with uh, an exemption card so that they know how to interact with law enforcement. They'll leave with syringes, quickers, cottons, tourniquets, um, offered referrals and resources, and the whole thing takes about 10 minutes. Awesome. Uh, anybody else have any more questions? Um, I don't have a question. I just wanted to say thank you so much for doing this. Um, I work in the ER intermittently um, and the extended stay where we often um, take care of patients who have overdosed and then discharge them. And um, I have not ever heard of, of what you what your guys are up to. And certainly it's we should have known and now we can now I can do so much better for these folks. So I really, really appreciate this. This is cool. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. I want I want everybody you come in contact with that's an active injector to be referred to the syringe access program. Absolutely. Um, and then we also do mobile syringe exchange in high drug traffic areas in the afternoons. So if you know of some areas that folks are um, having issues getting into the syringe access program, we want to make sure to um, get to them as well. So yes, we are your go-to for all things. And then we also do tours. I mean, Part of, our, part of our problem is, is there's no good media representation of a syringe access program. People think we're a dark and dingy house with toddlers running around or something like that because that's what the media has portrayed. And so it's really important that, you know, I, we can lure you in to see what we are and what we simply aren't. Um, and so that's been really helpful for us. Um, most recently, Justin Harper and the star paramedics have come in and toured um, because we hadn't had, we hadn't had that relationship with the paramedics before, but yes, let's, we can definitely work on getting um, tours. If you want to email me, um, it doesn't take any more than 30 minutes, but we would love for you to see that and just kind of be able to push forward with us together. Well, sweet. If no one has any more questions, I think we'll call it. Uh, Thanks everybody for coming and thanks especially to Lisa. This is such an awesome experience uh, and I appreciate it so much. Thanks team, really appreciate it.